So um, thank you for uh, inviting me and um, thank you for the quick introduction. If you know Stefano uh, well, you know that it's uh, you know much more difficult to find him at home than on a plane. So probably he he could be watching us from from a plane. He's traveling all around, so it's very difficult to to catch him. So. Um, Anyways, uh, I'm going to present this work, which is uh, joined with my colleague Stefano um, and uh, <clears throat> a couple of students. Stefano Schiavoni, now he works at Google. Uh, Eduardo Colombo, now he works at uh, Amadeus Software. And uh, Lorenzo Cavallaro, who most of you may, may know him for uh, his good work on uh, malware analysis and system, system security. Um, this works as two names, Phoenix and Cerberus. The original name in the talk was just ju just mentioning uh, Phoenix, but in the meantime we, we did some progress and so I decided to um, to include also um, some updates on, on Cerberus as well. Um, as you may guess, we are talking about botnets and uh, it's been a hard time for me to find a botnet that hasn't been mentioned this morning. So most of the botnets have been uh, in, in the slide somehow, so I, I tried to find out an example that wasn't uh, that wasn't mentioned. Uh, before mentioning my example botnet, I just wanted to give you um, just mention my uh, the project that has funded these these uh, research and other of my research is the Sysec project. If you if you're curious about system security in Europe, system security research in Europe, uh, please have a look at the page and um, follow us on Twitter. So my example, the example that I chose is CryptoLocker, is uh, quite quite a recent uh, type of botnet, and uh, it's a ransom ransom type of botnet. What what this type of botnet does is once the machine gets infected, it encrypts all the files, all the all the files on that machine, and it really encrypts them uh, using you know str strong encryption. Um, apparently, there is one dedicated RSA key for for machine. So pretty sophisticated thing. And, and then it asks, it asks the, um, the computer owner uh, a ransom to be paid in exchange for releasing the files. It, fees, it first appeared in September 2013, and um, apparently, uh, according to the latest statistics, 41% uh, of the um, victims in the UK paid the ransom. And these gave the malicious guys earnings above uh, 25 million US dollars as of late 2013. And just a quick fun fact, it seems that the Massachusetts police office uh, paid the ransom to, to have their files released. Yeah. So how, um, this morning we have seen that there are many uh, architectures uh, that a botnet can use. One of these, and uh, one of the most popular one is uh, centralized architecture. Even though there are peer-to-peer uh, -peer botnets which are arising, the centralized architecture is still uh, used by many botnets. Also as a fallback mechanism in case the peer-to-peer -peer network goes starving or you know deadlocking, the uh, centralized is used as a backend. And one of the ways, <clears throat> one of the techniques that we can use to um, counteract this botnet is to do scene calling or in somehow some way to you know take over the command and control service in order to you know make the botnet harmless because the bots are not able to um, contact the bot master. So the, the, the malicious guys came up with a very sophisticated mechanism called railing mechanism in order to counteract this. One of the most you know bleeding edge uh, ways of doing this is to use so-called domain generation algorithms. In a domain generation algorithm, we have uh, the you know our pirate, our bot master, who registers one specific domain on a let's say weekly basis, depending on uh, how the botnet is configured. And then we have all the bots running a, 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 a so-called domain generation algorithm that generates lots of domains. Uh, on a given uh, random seed. The random seed could also include unpredictable information such as the Twitter trending topic or the specific result of a Google search in order to make this more difficult to you know, reverse engineer. And so the bot will start you know, querying all the domains and it will get of course a lot of non-existing domains replies because the majority of them will not exist. Only one will be the right one, which is the one that is registered by the bot master. So it will get a reply and the command and control channel is open. These of course create 
a huge asymmetry. This word has been mentioned this morning. Create a good, a high asymmetry between the, the defenders and the attackers. The defenders will have to go through thousands of domains for each day. And if they wanted to register them, it's going to be a lot of work and a lot of money. It's probably unfeasible to register all of them with the goal of trying to sync all the CNC. Instead, the attackers only have to take care of one domain per week or one domain per day, depending on how frequent the updates are. And of course, the, the blacklist approach, the you non-proactive know, approaches do not work quite well. Um, in, uh, I, I'm an academic, so uh, I will mention some of the uh, limitation of what we are doing. Um, as of now, we have several uh, research approaches that are able to characterize the traffic the, of a CNC server. But uh, the, ma the main limitation that we have found is that some, the majority of them uh, rely on supervised learning. So they need some information about mm -hmm. that domain is known to be a DGA, that other domain is not known to be a DGA, so label data which could be outdated yet mm -hmm. in order to create you know, a statistical model able to predict whether or not a new domain never seen before is a malicious DGA-based uh, domain. Another problem that we have found is that they, are, um, they work at the low levels of the DNS hierarchy, where all the rich data stays. If you work at the low level uh, DNS hierarchy, you get lots of information about the querying uh, hosts, you get information about you know where the query is coming from, but on the other hand, you have privacy issues if you really care, and uh, you have also the problem that these uh, monitoring uh, system are uh, hard to deploy. So, if you want to you know cover a wide area, you would have to deploy you know an observation point for each uh, low-level DNS result, which sometimes is unfeasible, especially from uh, from a researcher's um, perspective. So let's say if I can break this. Yes, it's going to break. No. OK. So our first work is called Phoenix. Uh, Phoenix is one of the um, is, is one of the of our works in this direction. And what it does is it takes um, DNS traffic from uh, passive monitors, so higher level of the DNS hierarchy, and it tries to learn the structure of a DGA and try to see to see if a new domain is actually a DGA or not. And the essence of, uh, of Phoenix is its ability to uh, characterize the linguistic properties of a domain. I'll show you with an example in a few slides. So um, what's the input of Phoenix? The input is a, a set of malicious domain, generally malicious domain. We don't care if they come from botnets or not. Any domain uh, would do. And we filter that using Phoenix. Um, example of data sources include exposure, um, fairly fairly known, um, feed of domain generation uh, of uh, malicious domains, then we have malware domain list and of course a lot of reversing and a lot of reporting and things like that. So what we do is we analyze this stream of data with Phoenix and we create so-called clusters of related domains that looks that look similar to each other and they have the properties of a DGA generated domain. How do we find if a domain is generated by a human or not? We try to infer some features. Well, actually, we compute some features. These features include, for instance, the uh, meaningful word ratio. In the example of an English dictionary, the word Facebook, so the domain facebook.com, has a high pronounceability. It has this linguistic property that is composed by two words, which are both um, pronounceable and existing in the, in the English dictionary. So we give it a ratio of one, which 100% is pronounceable. So this is likely non-DGA generated. On the other hand, such a string, pub 03s str, info, only contains one word in the English dictionary. And so the value is fairly low. So we'd say maybe this is likely to be generated by an automated algorithm. Another variant of this feature is the Engram Cup popularity. So basically we do the same exact thing, but instead of extracting known words, we extract the two grams or three grams or four grams, and then we rank them using, uh, using the dictionaries and we try to see how popular the sum of these rankings is. So if a, if a word is composed by uh, bigrams or trigrams, which, which are all very popular, then it's probably 
a word that has been mistyped, but still, it's a valid word. On the other hand, if it's all composed by non-popular or maybe non-existing bigrams or trigrams, then that it's probably a DGA. And if you project this in a two-dimensional space, you can see that um, here in this area, there are all the domains that are likely to be generated by humans, humanly generated domains. This is, uh, this is, for instance, the Alexa top 1 million domains. And if you go above a certain thresholds that we have calculated, you find domains that are probably generated not by a human or that are not pronounceable. And again, if you go even further, you will find domains that are quite likely to be uh, generated by an, an automated algorithm. And uh, if you use uh, those features to group the domains together, and if you project the distribution of this distance, you can see that the Alexa uh, top 1 million is uh, as a completely different distribution than other, uh, other um, botnet generated domains such as Bamital or Configure, ABC, and Torpic, etc. You can see that, you know, you can quite see that they are differently distributed. And here, if you cluster them, if you use the same features to cluster uh, the domain, uh, to cluster the domains, you will find that they map quite well in the two-dimensional space. And you can really see that here is one botnet, here is another botnet, maybe migrating somewhere else using other domains, and again and again. And here is just some noise. Here is an example of a uh, of a real. Um, clusters of two real clusters extracted uh, belonging to Palevo and uh, Sality. This is a set of IP and this is the set of domains. So of course, our system is not able to give a name of the, to the cluster. We are only able to say this is belonging to one botnet, this is belonging to one different botnet or another variant of that botnet. But with manual investigation, we were able to confirm that we are able to you know, separate them correctly. And when you are able to, you know, identify a botnet, to give a name, even symbolic name to a botnet, for instance, name 0F468, then you're able to do interesting things because you have an identifier that allows you to, you know, to keep track of them. For instance, we were able to track the takedown of this botnet from one that, you know, apparently the botmaster was, was trying to migrate from one autonomous system to another. You can see some of the CNC being seen cold and then again and again and then the botnet uh, after a while, it's been taken down. And here, an, uh, a sim another another example of a migration from a Korean autonomous system to other Korean autonomous systems over time. If you're interested in uh, uh, in knowing more about Phoenix, I invite you to uh, you know to join Dimva, which is uh, going to be held at Hogwarts this year. Um, this is, of course, not Hogwarts, but it really likes it. Really looks like Hogwarts. This is Royal Holloway University of London. Um, and this is not a group of magicians, this is just a group of students. Uh, our, our paper is going to be presented there. Uh, the public version is not out yet, but if you're interested, just let me know and we'll, you know, give you, a, uh, just a, you know, preprint copy of the PDF. Uh, Phoenix has some shortcomings. Uh, it is not able to characterize well the domains for which, um, we don't have enough enough evidence. So basically, if there is a new DGA for which we don't have any domains or any domain to IP mapping in the past, we are not basically uh, able to have enough training data to you know uh, um, to to get a result. So we uh, upgraded our system, so to speak. We uh, we added some more functionalities in order to cope specifically with this uh, missing point, and we created another creature called Cerberus this time. Uh, Cerberus, uh, before coping with the lack of, uh, with the lack of information on, on certain domains, on new threats, mm -hmm. first of all, we had to cope with a thing that I think every large scale system has to cope with, which is trying to reduce the, the computational effort as much as we can. We have seen with, with Emiliano that when, when you're processing a lot of data, uh, the, the resources are just limited and uh, you, you want to optimize the things uh, as much as you can. So the first thing that we did is um, we, we, we created this filtering phase that given a DNS stream try to, tries to get rid of the domains that are not suspicious. We don't care if some you know uh, benign domain gets through the filter, but if it's a minority, it's okay. We can still manage that. Uh, 
So we have a list of heuristics that we are we use to, um, to to determine whether a domain is suspicious or not. If it's suspicious, even if we have the lightest uh, evidence that it could be suspicious, we keep it. The first one is, of course, the domain popularity. If uh, if if it's a, if it's a DGA, it is it is very unlikely that it will make it to the top list of Alexa or to the top list of any you know popularity uh, on, on on any you know ranking of domains because it will last for a few days or for a few weeks. So the first thing that we do is we have a, a set of white lists such as the Alexa top one million, and if that domain is not there, uh, we keep it as suspicious. Again, another filtering module is the CDN filter. Uh, DGAs, uh, domain generation algorithms, are also used for benign purposes. One of the benign purposes that um, are the most popular ones is the um, content delivery network. Content delivery networks need to generate domains in a dynamic way. And uh, sometimes they look like DGAs. So we found out a lot of false positives in our uh, previous version of our system. And so we included a white list of, uh, of the CDNs in order to to reduce uh, the, the, the amount of false positive and also the amount of domains to process. Also, you have some um, top-level domains for which you need clearance in order to register. And of course, our friend, the pirate, will not go to try to register a DGA on a military domain or a .gov domain. Well, you never know. But anyways, it's very unlikely that our malicious guy will try to register a DGA, uh, a DGA-generated domain on a, you know, Top level domain that requires clearance. So we filter that out. Another thing that we feel we use to filter is the time to leave. Uh, a couple of years ago, two, three years ago, um, um, research um, demonstrated that um, domains that leave, that have a time to leave below 100 are likely to be uh, malicious or associated to, to some DGA related activity. Uh, a couple of years later, if you're interested in the, in, there is a, the link here on the Blackhead, on the Blackhead website, <coughs> on the Blackhead, uh, talks. Uh, they measure, the Palo Alto guys measure that these time is changing because the malicious guys are trying to save resources and share the domains for multiple, multiple goals. So, um, the idea is that now this TTL is changing. If you, if you're really looking for a malicious domain, you shouldn't go from uh, below 100, 100 but you should go between one uh, between 80 and 300 seconds and we expect this trend to increase a little bit and again we use uh, the phoenix dga filter which filters out domains that look pronounceable in case we found them and then we use uh, we use a who is data uh, data feed um, kindly provided by uh, virus total and um, um, we, we, we use their API, which is another, I mean, this is another example of what virus total can do uh, in addition to other useful things. So we use this service in order to uh, find out if a domain has a who is entry. If the domain has a who is entry, then it's probably, uh, it's probably benign. But if there is a who is entry that shows that the domain has been registered in the last few days, we keep it as suspicious because, of course, the malicious guys will will not take a domain lasting uh, a lo long time or they, they will not register a domain a long in advance. So given an example of uh, a data feed that includes 5,000, 500,000 domains, uh, sorry, 550,000 domains, uh, we end up... Uh, going through this pipeline with a list of 300 uh, domains that will not go, uh, will not match any of the rules, and these are deemed suspicious by, by our system. So now we want to find whether these suspicious domains match any of the known botnets that Phoenix have identified before. So we use uh, a classifier. This classifier takes as input the query, the query is, for instance, the name of the domain. <coughs> Sorry, and the data, the data set that it uses to to find uh, if there is a matching query is the set of cluster. Here, for example, you have a two or three clusters as an example, and the classifier tries to find if there is a match a cluster that matches the IP. If, if if it finds one, then the job is concluded. If it doesn't find one, it takes all the clusters 
and we train a classifier, and I'll show you in a bit how we do it. We train a classifier on all the cluster, and then we use the input trying to match, uh, to, trying to find the cluster that best represents uh, our new domains that we have never seen, probably. And in this case, we find a matching entry in cluster B. Uh, how do we find, how do we train a classifier? We need a way to uh, model the distance, so to speak, between this domain and all the domains within, a, within each cluster. So um, the distance metric that we use is called subsequence string kernel. And it has been developed at uh, Hogwarts in 2002. And this magic technique, uh, it basically divides the string in a, in a, in a number of substrings. And uh, what it does is it tries to find how many common substrings, not necessarily contiguous one, are found in both the strings that we want to compare. In this case, the strings are cat and car. And we find out using a decay factor, lambda, that these two strings have a lot in common. And as a result, we have a number zero in zero one. Zero means that they are uh, similar, one they are distant. And we train an SVM, which is one of uh, which is one of the classifiers that you can use if you have labels as input. Uh, what the SVM tries to find is if there is uh, a way to project the data in a two-dimensional space in order to find a good separation hyperplane to tell the two classes apart. In these cases, the two classes are cluster A, cluster B, and we do it on every you know couple of of clusters. Uh, we have run the result. We have run uh, this analysis on um, on the CIE uh, data set provided in the past. It was provided by the Internet uh, Software Consortium, uh, and now it's provided by Farsight. They basically give you a they basically give you a list of um, they basically give you access to data that um, is passive DNS data. And we found out that in most of the cases, we are uh, able to go about 95% of accuracy in, uh, uh, in determining the right, the correct class of, of, a, of a new domain. <coughs> Sorry. In some cases, we are not performing so well. So in the case of uh, 92 or 91, uh, accuracy is not quite satisfactory. So we looked into it and we tried to find, to find what was the cause. The cause was, uh, this is the uh, pairwise distance of each domain on each cluster. So here on the top you have one cluster, here on the bottom you have another cluster. And you can see that if one cluster at, at the top is very well formed, is very compact and dense, there are certain other clusters where we don't perform really well that are much more spread, much more, you know, random, so to speak, even though random is not the right word. Uh, but so we, we try to, to find a better way to, to cope with this. This is what, this is uh, the time detective jobs. Time detective is, is the last component of Phoenix, sorry, of Cerberus. And what it does is it observes the activity of the, of the bots. So again, we collect all the domains for, for which we don't have any previous knowledge. So for all the domains that are classified in a, in a wrong way, low accuracy. And the first thing that we do is we group them by autonomous system. Why do we do that? Because we assume that our friend the pirate is lazy. And uh, the point is, when they find an obliging uh, autonomous system, they will probably continue buying IPs into that uh, autonomous system, meaning that they uh, they stick to, they stick there because they can you know continue work undisturbed. So we group them by autonomous system and we forget momentarily the information about the IP. Then we run a, another clustering routine, which in this uh, in, in in this case we use another uh, clustering technique. It's called uh, DBSCAN. What DBSCAN does? These points are the domains. Uh, for every domain, it walks from domain to domain, and it tries to measure the distance between the two domains into one cluster. And if the distance is within epsilon, uh, we consider them as part of the same cluster. And we continue going, walking on each point, until we find at least a certain number of points, and we decide to form a cluster. What is these minimum points, domain per cluster, that we want to uh, to have. In this case, uh, in, our, in, our, in our experience, we assume that 
um, the bots try, will try to contact the command and control server at least once a day. It's a conservative uh, decision, but we have seen that it works quite well. And so we, we, we uh, basically uh, inform our system to build cluster that contains at least seven uh, domains per uh, each of them. And where do we stop? What is the, 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 the threshold that, that we want to, that we want to enforce? In order to find a threshold, we want to learn from this lesson. We don't want to have clusters like these anymore. We want to have compact and dense cluster that have a high, uh, close distance between each element inside them and they are very far away from each other. So we minimize what is called the ratio between the intra-cluster and the inter-cluster distance. If, it, if this quantity goes to zero, it means that you have lots of clusters which are very far from each other, but they are very compact within them. Last point, what if instead of, um, instead of having two clusters, what if these two clusters are actually one, the migrated version of the same CNC to another autonomous system? Um, in order, it, it happens uh, as you may, I mean, as you may imagine that when, when a malicious guy get caught, uh, it tries to migrate as soon as possible his infrastructure to another IP and continue using the same domain. But, uh, in order to, to, to make, to make sure that we are not considering them as two separate clusters, um, what we do is we run a merging routine. What the merging routine does is assume that you have two clusters of domains. Here you have the domains here, and then you have the same domains, and then you have the distances, the pairwise distances from each domain to each other domain. And then you have another cluster that is possibly the migration of the previous one. So you, uh, you ask yourself, what if we merge these two clusters? Do we obtain something that makes more sense than the two clusters alone? In order to answer to this question, we use, uh, we use some statistics and in specifically we use, uh, the Welch test. The Welch test is able to tell whether it is better to have one, uh, distribution made from one cluster or it is better to have a distribution of distances made from the merging of the two clusters. So it basically tries to quantify the evidence that you have against or toward merging. And here is an example of how the routine works. Day one, we collect some domains. Day seven, we have a lot of domains. And then um, we group by AES. We forget the information about the IPs. We do the merging. We run the clustering routines. And we find out that these domains that were in initially separated from the other cluster are actually forming one cluster. Again, we run, the, we run this routine on, on the same data set. And we were able to label in, in one week of example data, we were able to uh, label 187 domains classified as malicious, correctly labeled. And uh, further investigation found out that we were correctly identifying configure as the right, as the right botnet. Again, uh, we were able to, um, I think I'm quite off of time, so I'm running to the conclusion. And here another example to show how this uh, clustering routine could be accurate. We were able even to find variants of the same botnet. For example, you can see that Jadre here has three different versions of the same uh, DGA, but uh, probably with three different seeds to generate them. And even though they, be, they, they use similar domains on different uh, first level domain, they have you know, mixed IPs that goes from, you know, some to these two variants, you share the same IP, these other variants do not share any of the IP. So you can see that these, uh, this type of DGA was quite difficult to, you know, to, to detect that they were three different ones. Uh, but we were able to, to find the differences, uh, thanks to our clustering routines. So since I'm off of time, I'm running right to the conclusion in future work. Um, the first future work that we will, I mean, we are working on is something that you might have spotted yet. Uh, this is in fact a very easy way to evade the linguistic filter because this domain is perfectly pronounceable in English, but uh, it actually could be used as a DGA. So instead of using the, the single letters to build a DGA generated domain, 
the malicious guys could and probably are already doing that use words in order to evade these kind of filters and hopefully uh, in the next uh, in the next year we'll be uh, trying to you know develop this further and release it as a web service so sorry for going out of time thank you very much yeah thanks I don't want to take time. If, if there is uh, time for questions, otherwise I'll be around here to, to take questions offline. I'm